how the sound is. Okay, right. Um, well, do you, do you want to ask me questions, or how do you want to um, do this? Yeah, what I'd like to do, um, I'm going to have you give, first of all, maybe a little history of the house. Right. And then um, kind of what your impressions that Frank Lloyd Wright had on architecture here in California. Right. Um, I also wanted to talk about how this house differed from his other designs. Sure, sure, yeah. And... Um, Difficulties in the construction of this house based on the hexagons. Right. Yeah. I read a little bit about how the contractors were off a, a third of an inch and it would have came out to three inches by. Well, I don't think I know that story. Yeah. That's what I thought I knew all the stories about the house, but oh, there are lots. Yeah, there are lots of, of uh, really interesting things to talk about with that. With yeah, the house. The, I think the construction. So, do you want, first want, want me to just give the basic facts of like the the story of the house and when it was built and so forth? Just I think to, so. Yeah, that's a good place <clears> to start out. Okay. And then talk about some of the unique features. Yeah. Well, just break you know break in at any point. And, I will. Because I don't want to. I don't have a lecture all ready to give or anything like that. So it's it's probably better if I respond to. To um, to questions. But as to, the, the house was built in 1937, and it was built by a young uh, uh, professor and his wife Paul and Jean Hanna, who were. Uh, specialists in childhood education. That was their field. He came to Stanford. They were they were just a young couple in their in their thirties, uh, and he came to, to Stanford, or maybe they were younger than that. He came to Stanford to uh, teach in the education school. How's it going? We're, we're rolling. You guys, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wasn't right. sure. that's okay. <laughs> so it was so it was built by uh, by these two um, young people, Gene and, and Paul Hanna, who were both experts on. Uh, Childhood education, and um, and they were also fans of Frank Lloyd Wright's work. They had seen his uh, buildings and pictures, and they had read a, a book by him with his philosophy of architecture. And so they uh, contacted him and asked him if they uh, if he'd design a house for them that they could build on a relatively modest uh, budget because they didn't have an awful lot of money. And so he uh, he did. He actually came out here. He came out several times both before and then after the house was built. And eventually he decided this, this was one of his most important houses. It was one of his favorite designs because it was so innovative. There were things that he did here that he had never done before in his, in his work. And that was because these, this young couple was so um, excited about his ideas that they allowed him to do things that he had wanted to do for many years but had never been able to find clients who were willing to, to do. And the main one here, there are a lot of innovations. But pr the main one is the geometry of the, of the plan of, of the house. When you just look around and walk through the house, you see that, it's, that there are no right angles anywhere. It's all, the walls all come together at, at, at 60 and 120 degree angles, and it's all based on, on hexagons. And, the, and if you look down at the, at the floor, it's, you can see that this, this floor slab, the, the concrete slab, has, uh, is all made of hexagons that are inscribed in it, and the, and the walls uh, all follow along this, uh, the, the edges of these hexagons. And so the question is, why did, why did Frank Lloyd Wright do this? And uh, it really, it's, it, it all fit into his, one of his ideas about architecture, which he sometimes described as, um, as breaking open the box of traditional architecture. One of his big innovations and in, in the ways that he changed American architecture was by, by loosening up architecture so that spaces flow onto, uh, from one to another, so that rooms open onto each other, and, and the inside and the outside of the house open, that there's often no real distinction between the inside and the outside, and, uh, and everything kind of moves in this fluid kind of way. And he had been doing that already ever since by the turn of the century with uh, what he called the prairie house in, uh, type, which was in the, in the Midwest. Uh, but then he wanted to take these ideas farther, and he came up with this idea that if he did away with right angles, that it would make it even more, he would break open the box of traditional architecture even more. And so he started exploring the idea of, of using different kinds of geometry in, uh, instead of right angles or rectangles. And uh, the hexagon was one of them, and he tried other ideas too, circles, for example. But, and, 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 but this was really the first house that he built that completely did away with the right angle and, uh, and the tall hexagons. And in some ways, this leads into his later work like the um, Guggenheim Museum in New York, which is all based on circles. Uh, 
and he designed other buildings based on triangles. And but the, but this is really the beginning of it here in, in 19 in 37 when this was um, when this was built. And as a result, when you walk through the house, you I, I think you sense this kind of fluid. You're, it's like you're flowing from one space to another, and and the house opens out into the uh, to the landscape beyond, and it's. Uh, there's no, you, you can't even talk about how many rooms there are in this house. It's, uh, there aren't separate, isolated rooms. It all opens uh, from one place to another. And um, part of his idea, I think, with this was to, was to encourage a, a, a new kind of more freer lifestyle. Uh, he recognized that, um, that the family structure was changing starting in the early 20th century, that families, that American families were not as formal as they used to be, with severe, where they had certain functions in certain rooms, like the parlor that would only be used for fancy occasions, and then you'd close the doors and not use that for you know, most of the time. And so the American lifestyle was becoming looser and, uh, and less formal. And his houses were really a response to that. And a, and a desire to, to, uh, to make things even more dynamic and, uh, and informal. And so this, is, this house is a good example of how he's really creating a completely new type of space for the, for the American family to, uh, to lead a less formal lifestyle in. And, um, and all of these things had a, had a tremendous influence on American architecture. So that what we think of as just kind of normal suburban ranch style houses uh, that of course have been built in the millions in the, since, since the Second World War were really greatly influenced by, by these ideas of Frank Lloyd Wright. But they don't all look like, like this house because here he was taking these ideas to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the extreme really and taking them beyond what in some ways are even practical. In some ways this house is not particularly practical to live in because it's so unusual. It's hard. For example, if you have a house with no right angles in it, with no rooms that, that are rec rectangles, it's hard to furnish it for one thing. I mean, you can't put normal furniture in, in a house like this. And, um, and so Frank Lloyd Wright designed all of the furniture, you know, hexagonal and, and, and triangular pieces of furniture, chairs like the one I'm sitting in here. When he originally designed the house, the, the beds were all hexagonal. But they were so impractical to, you know, you had to get hexagonal mattresses and, and, and uh, specially made sheets and things like that. So the Hannas finally, they said, this is too much, you know, we, we'll go along with most of these ideas, but we, they had to get rid of the hexagonal beds. So, um, and then some of the chairs he designed, there's a, a the, the dining chair, the original dining chairs for the house were, um, had just three legs. And the problem with them was that they tended to tip over. And so some of the, the Hannah's guests, uh, you know, would, uh, if they leaned the wrong way, they would uh, tip over. And the, there's a wonderful letter that, where the Hannah's wrote to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and said, we've got to uh, get rid of these chairs. And uh, he, said, uh, he said, I re realize I'm not a very good furniture designer. Throw out the chairs. So they did, except for one. And there's only one that sur sur uh, survives, and it's over there. And, uh, they, they, they kept it, but they, they didn't use the chairs. So, um, so there are lots of, uh, of funny stories about and anecdotes about the history of the house and certain things that are, that are clearly Im impractical. But it was like he was, had an idea that he wanted to take to the limits and, and to, um, to take, his, take his ideas and see how far he could push them. He was constantly experimenting with new, new ideas. Some, and some things didn't work out very well, and then he would try something else. He never really repeated his, uh, the, the same design. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, designed thousands of, of buildings. He had probably the longest architectural career of any architect, uh, maybe ever. He, he uh, lived in, to the age of 92, and he had started practicing architecture when he was uh, about 20 years old. So he had a, uh, and, he, and he worked right up to the, to the end. When he was 92 years old, he was designing the, the Marin County Civic Center here. And um, so he had a career of over 70 years, which is just really un unprecedented. And he designed thousands of buildings, and none of them are the same. And uh, it's almost as though each one of them ha tries out some different idea. Unique 
versus some of the other California? Well, the, first of all, the most unique thing is just that, he, that it's all hexagons and that this is the first time he built a house with this geometry of, of hexagons. So that's the really, that's the unique thing. Uh, he tried out some other interesting ideas here. Um, two very thin uh, walls, the wooden walls are, um, are not like a, the, uh, a normal wooden wall that has stud construction of two by fours with, uh, with sheetrock on, on either side. Uh, it's, it's, it's what he called a sandwich wall with uh, redwood boards that are just screwed together so it's, they're very narrow walls. And one of the reasons he wanted to do that is that the, as a result, the, the walls of the house and also the, um, the glass windows, because they follow the lines of the hexagon around, they, they almost look like folding screens. They're, almost, they're not really like real walls. Uh, and I think you get that, that sense of how it's like almost Japanese screens. Uh, and um, it was another part of this idea of his that he didn't want this to look like it was made of boxes of traditional walls, that it's just uh, open and very dynamic, that everything kind of flows and, and moves. So that was the, um, the, the, the really um, innovative thing about this house, not just for California, but it, it had never been done anywhere else. And um, each one of his California houses is unique in one way or another. Bit of how it was designed on the hill, how it kind of flows with the. That's right. Uh, when um, when Wright first designed the house, it's an interesting story. The Hannas asked him to design the house, but they had not found a um, a piece of property yet. They were still looking for and trying to figure out how they would, get, and they were trying to get the university to uh, to allow them to to build on university land, which this actually is. This is part of the Stanford campus, and. Um, and so uh, first, Frank Lloyd Wright designed the house uh, as if it was going to be on a level site. But then when they acquired this piece of property, it, uh, it's on a, on a hill. And, um, and he loved that because he, li he liked building houses on, on hills. But usually what he would do would, was not to put them right on the top of the hill because he didn't want it to dominate the landscape. He always wanted it to look as though architecture was fitting into the landscape and was part of, of nature. And so he wanted it built into the side of the hill, but that cr creates a problem whenever you do that, that the, the, uh, the house you want to have on a, on, a, on a level floor, of course, even though there's several different um, um, there's steps in this house, so you kind of move from one level to another. But still, it basically had to be a, uh, a level uh, site for the, for the um, concrete slab. And so they had to do what's called in architecture cut and fill which is that you build a retaining wall on the lower side of the hill and then cut out some of the uh, earth from the upper part and put it in behind the retaining wall to make a, a, a level uh, surface. And that's what they did here. And then they poured the, um, the concrete slab and then sized this hexagonal pattern in it and then built the, the walls uh, following the hexagon. But actually, this, this cut and fill operation of uh, creating the uh, the site for the house was one of the problems that led to the damage in the earthquake of 1989. The house was, was badly damaged in the Loma Prieta earthquake of, of 89. And um, it just now has been, uh, been restored and is, uh, and is um, open for public tours again. It, really, it was, um, had, had been closed uh, for, for about 10 years. But, uh, and one of the, and, and there were, the, the earthquake damage was um, very complex and it was actually hard for the engineers to analyze and figure out what really had been wrong because it's such an unusual house that it didn't fit into the normal patterns for the engineer, seismic engineers and architects to, uh, to figure out what, what really went wrong. But when they finally figured it out, they realized that one of the problems was that the, um, that the soil that had been filled in for the slab to be built on had not been, had been, hadn't been compacted well enough. Uh, when you do that, you have to use steamrollers and everything and go over it and really pound the, the soil down to make it uh, nice and solid. And that hadn't been done adequately here. And uh, as a result, in the, the, in the earthquake, the, the soil underneath had, um, had dropped a bit in places and the concrete slab had actually broken up. And that was one of the problems. Another problem was that the, um, that the central brick uh, fireplace uh, the, uh, core, the chimney area, uh, 
uh, had, um, had twisted in the earthquake and, and cracked, and there were problems in the roof. Or there, there was damage with the roof as a result. And that was probably because that this um, uh, brick core had, didn't, hadn't been reinforced properly with, um, with steel. And so we had to go in and, uh, and uh, put concrete, reinforced concrete, inside the, um, uh, the brick. It was a very complicated repair operation for this uh, house that took years just to figure out what was really wrong and what could be done to fix it. Well, uh, Wright was, had always been fascinated with, with geometry, ever since he was a child. In fact, an interesting story that, that he told himself was that, that when, when he was a, a young child, his mother gave him a, uh, as, uh, as a present what was called, um, the, uh, it was a children's educational toy called, uh, not exactly a toy, but called the Furbel Blocks, and uh, the Furbel System of Education, which was a, a German educator in the late 19th century who had developed this. And w what it involved was, was uh, different blocks and, 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 and shapes uh, made out of wood and also paper that children would play with and put together to explore different ge geometric uh, properties of geometry and, um, and systems of, of order. And, um, and Wright uh, later used to talk about how that really inspired his uh, interest in architecture in, uh, in, in many ways. And, from the beginning, he was interested in, in unusual types of, uh, of geometry, this whole idea of breaking open the box of, of traditional architecture. And so he tried that with different, uh, different forms, hexagons, triangles, uh, circles, just to see what new kinds of, uh, of spaces and new kinds of forms he, he could create. He was, it was just part of this uh, constant exploration that he was always looking for, for, for new ways of doing things. And so the hexagon was just one of these, but it wasn't, he did, it wasn't that he necessarily felt that, the, that all houses should be, should be based on hexagons. And in fact, after this house was built, he did explore it further in some other designs, but it's not as though all the rest of his buildings were, were hexagons. He just kept on, he, he went on to explore with other things. He was just one of these people who was n never satisfied with, with one solution to things. He was always trying to f come up with something new. to really break away from the box type? Was this the beginning of his Well, it wasn't. He had, all, he had been doing that uh, already in, in various other kinds of ways, but it, it, it was a very extreme form of that. You know, it, uh, it, um, it, so it al allowed him to do it in a way that he had never done it before. But you, I, one has to admit that there were some problems that resulted. It's not the most practical house to live in. And, um, so he was, in some ways, he was kind of taking an idea, taking it to its limits, pushing it, in some ways, beyond its limits, because, in some ways, it's not a, it's not a very practical house to live in. The, the 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 Hannahs who built the house and lived in it for the rest of their life loved the house, and they they would not have uh, have agreed with me about that. They uh, they thought the house was perfect because it fit their lifestyle, and they were willing to make the adjustments that that you need to make to live in a in such an unusual house. But other people who have lived in the house or who might live in the house probably would, uh, would find problems with it. Um, the rooms are all open onto one another. There's not very much privacy, for one thing. Uh, it's, it's hard to, put, um, to furnish the house. It, um, normal furniture really doesn't work in, in the house. It's very hard to put, uh, put uh, square pieces of furniture, like I said, in, the, in beds. The, they had to have these hexagonal beds, at least originally. So it's not, it's just, it, uh, a, a, another problem is that, um, that it's hard to, um, uh, it's not a house which works very well with, with pictures on the wall, the normal works of art, big pictures. It's the walls that are, that are beautiful themselves. The house is the work of art in many ways. And um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright liked, uh, liked some, to hang some things on his walls, like Japanese prints, and he had certain very specific ideas about how his houses should be furnished. But um, he's, they're, they're uh, 
well-known stories of him going back to, uh, to houses that he designed and rearranging the furniture, telling people that they have to get rid of, of uh, various things they had because they didn't work in his houses. And um, so, um, so they can be difficult to, to live in. But it, most of the people who built Frank Lloyd Wright houses swear by them and, uh, and uh, just love the, the houses and, uh, and appreciate how, what great works of art they, they are themselves. Um, All the houses in, in, in the San Francisco area are like that. I think the Hannahs loved their house. The, uh, the Franks who live in, uh, in their house in, in Hillsborough love it. And uh, I know that uh, Mrs. Berger does. And uh, so that's typical of, uh, of people who live in, in Frank Lloyd Wright houses. But they're a special breed of people. Yeah. about the Berger House. Maybe we can add some here. Um, I was uh, pretty much, you've, you've hit all the points that I've written down. Um, but I had a, a question about the, the piece from the Imperial Hotel that was brought over. That's right. Do you have any comments yeah. on that? No, it's just a, it's, it's not really part of this house, but it, it, it um, was uh, acquired by the, the Hannahs, and they set it up on the, on the lawn out there, but then it was damaged in the, in the earthquake, and it's now in storage, so you can't actually see it. Mm -hmm. It's actually it's in a big box out in the, uh, in the carport. It's all crated up. And what it was was a big uh, stone urn, a really a large decorative object, really, but it's very, very large. Um, that was um, part of the um, design for the Imperial Hotel, which was a hotel in, in Tokyo that um, Wright uh, built in the, in the teens, just before 1920, and uh, 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 with an unusual, using an unusual kind of volcanic stone. It's called, I um, can't remember the name of the stone. But at any rate, uh, uh, the, and the Imperial Hotel was, uh, uh, was demolished or taken down, and part of it was moved in the um, in the 1960s, um, uh, I guess it was. And the um, in the process, the Hannahs acquired one of these urns, and they and they brought it here and, and put it up on the site. But it um, it also was damaged in the in the earthquake because this volcanic stone is very um, fragile. So we're hoping to. Uh, to repair that, but we haven't. The, we decided the important thing was to repair the house, and get that back together, and then later worry about some of these details. Um, how about the trees? The way that he designed this around the trees. Yeah. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright, as I suggested, was always um, uh, interested in making his houses fit in with the landscape and and, and nature. He 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 didn't want his houses to to stand out and to dominate. Uh, nature too much. He, he wanted to, there to be kind of blending between the two. And so the, the trees that were on this site, he wanted to keep as many of them as possible. And there were some beautiful oak trees. And one in particular down at the bedroom end of the house, uh, he did actually designed the end of the house around the, the, the tree or one of the branches of the, of the tree. And the tree has grown and is, is, is bigger now, of course, but it's still, you can still see how, how the house was designed around the uh, uh, around the tree, and it's just typical of, of Wright's desire to uh, always to be aware of, of nature and to make it seem as though nature and, uh, and architecture are living together and interacting in some kind of, uh, of um, almost kind of, a kind of dialogue of, of the two, like the architecture is talking to the nature in, a, in, a, in this wonderful kind of way. Um, how about the use of the house now? What are you going to be using? Right, the, uh, the committee that, uh, that I've been chairing since the earthquake to, to oversee the, um, the restoration of the house, we had to uh, decide early on what, what the house was going to be used for when, it was, uh, when we got it restored. And before the earthquake, it had been used as a, as a residence, uh, as the, the Hannahs had lived here, it had been used as the official residence of the provost of, of the university. But we decided that, um, that after the restoration, the house uh, should no longer be used as a, as a full-time residence, but that it, it should be used for other purposes that would make it more available and accessible to the, to the public. People come to see this house from, from around the world, architects. It's a, 
a famous house that, uh, that architects often come to almost like a kind of pilgrimage site. And, uh, and so we wanted to, to make it more, more open to, uh, to people and also to use it for university functions, various kinds, receptions and seminars and, um, and other kinds of functions that, so that it can be appreciated by as many people as possible. One other, one other thing I might mention about the house that's another, you asked me about uh, what kind of innovations it has. There was another thing that was very unusual about the design of the house, which was that the, um, the house was, was designed right from the beginning by Frank Lloyd Wright, working together with the Hannas themselves, designed with the idea that the house would change over the years and would evolve with the family. The, uh, the Hannas had three young children, and because they were... Uh, uh, in the field of, of childhood education, they had very definite ideas about how, uh, how the house should, uh, should be used by the family and, and for the children. And so they, together with Wright, uh, devised this plan that had this kind of complex evolution that the house would, go, uh, would undergo. At, at first, it was designed with three very small children's rooms, bedrooms, and a large playroom, so that the, with the idea that the, the children could be in their own room if they really wanted to be alone or to sleep, but that normally they would be playing together in this, in this playroom area. But then the idea was that when the, ch when the children grew up and left uh, the house, that the, uh, that the playroom would be turned into a large, large uh, dining room because the original plan, in, in the original plan, there was just a small area for a dining table and that the three children's bedrooms, that the, all the walls would be removed. It was designed so that the walls could all be taken out and that, that that would become a larger master bedroom for the parents and their smaller bedroom would be turned into a larger study. And so it was, it, and this is exactly what happened. Uh, and it was all uh, a part of the original plan. So that's another interesting uh, innovation in the house that it had this idea that it would evolve over the, uh, along with the family. Right. You, this is sometimes called a Usonian house, uh, and, and this was a term that, that Wright um, just in, invented, really. It was just a word that he came up with uh, to describe a type of architecture that he was working on in the, mainly in the 1930s when this house was, was built. He, um, he said that it, was, uh, that it was, uh, came from the idea of U.S., the United States, that, this was, that he was creating a uh, a type of American architecture for ordinary American people. So it was U U.S. Onian, Usonian. And, um, and his idea was to, to take a lot of these uh, uh, principles that he had developed over the years, but that in his earlier work he had mainly designed houses for wealthier people, large houses. And he wanted to take these ideas and and adapt them for, for very modest houses. This house is not all that modest. They, when, they, when the Hannas originally told him that they wanted to build a house on a small budget, he, um, they thought that the house would uh, cost about $15,000 was their original goal. But then they and the Hanna and, and, and Frank Lloyd Wright, their ideas kept expanding and it eventually ended up being uh, not quite as modest a house. But for most of his Usonian houses, he really he designed houses that could be built on a, on a very limited budget. They were often very small, um, and um, and they were built in very large numbers uh, throughout the United States. Most of them did not use the hexagons; they were more had used more conventional rectangular geometry. Uh, but they um, the kinds of innovations they had were, for example, that the that the living room and the dining room were were together. The dining room was often a space sort of halfway between the living room and the kitchen. And so it, it, um, they were more economical. They didn't need as many rooms. And they, uh, 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 if another one of his ideas that uh, uh, was the, that uh, then instead of having a separate garage, traditional garage, there would simply be a roof over, a, over the entryway. And this was the carport idea. He really developed the carport. There are all these ideas that, that he developed that then became standard aspects of, uh, of suburban American uh, housing. And so in the, in the, um, in the uh, uh, Northern California area, for example, he, uh, his ideas uh, 
were very influential with, in particular, through the um, developer Joseph Eichler. You, you may have heard of the Eichler houses that were built in the Bay Area in the 1940s and 50s and 60s in large numbers. And Joseph Eichler uh, actually lived in one of Frank Lloyd Wright's houses briefly, the, the, the Frank House in, in Hillsborough. And he was inspired to, uh, to take some of these ideas of Wright's, these Usonian ideas, uh, and to adapt them the, to tract houses, really, was what he built. So large developments of, of, of small, rel relatively inexpensive houses, and uh, through the work of Eichler and other developers, taking Wright's ideas uh, and applying them, uh, Wright's principles really had a tremendous effect on American suburban architecture. So that what we think of as the, as the normal kind of suburban house in America, in many ways, is based on the principles of Frank Lloyd Wright. Though not as, the, they're not as extremely as, as this house, but, uh, but still um, strongly influenced by Wright. The concepts, yeah. Right. Um, how about the Burger House? Um, any comments? Well, the Burger House is, is is a wonderful house, which in which is later than the, the than the Hannah House, um, uh, and, but it, it explores some some similar ideas. Again, this exploration of geometry uh, in in the Burger House. There there are wonderful geometric things that are done with triangles, for example, and very interesting use of unusual angles and it's a different different materials are used there stone and and concrete rather than the brick uh, and wood of uh, of the Hannah house so it's just it's an, another wonderful example of how each of Wright's buildings is is different and, and unique in, um, in in one way or another also the site of the, of the burger house is so dramatic on that uh, steep uh, hill and with the views and it's 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 a wonderful house um, how about the Frank House? The, uh, the, the Frank House in, um, uh, in Hillsborough, which is sometimes called the Bassett House because it was actually built by a family called, named Bassett. But the, um, and then uh, several years later, it was, it was bought by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Frank. Um, and Mrs. Frank still, still lives in the, in the house. Mr. Frank died uh, last year. And um, the, uh, uh, the Frank House was, was built just a couple of years after, after this house. And it was, and, and Mr. Bassett, uh, or Mr. and Mrs. Bassett, I guess, had, had visited this house and were so uh, overwhelmed by it that they uh, contacted Wright and said, we want one like, like the Hannah House. And so that also is based on, on hexagons. Uh, but it's not the same as, as this house. He, he never repeated a plan. Uh, uh, unlike a lot of uh, architects or artists who, uh, if they uh, uh, hit on a good thing, they really just kind of crank, keep cranking them out. He even, even with uh, the Frank House, where the client said, "We want one like the the, the Hannah House," uh, Wright uh, uh, ch changed it and did uh, unusual and different things there. So it has a different kind of personality, but it it has the same hexagonal grid that underlies the plan. Is there anything else that you can think of that's unique to this house that might be worth? I think I've touched on the main, yeah. Film things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is one other thing that that you might uh, try to if, if see if you can somehow get this in um, in, in in the filming, um, which is not not something unique about about this house. It's it's in fact very typical of all of Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture. But it's another kind of very fundamental characteristic of of his work, which is that he is constantly manipulating space. Uh, to create dynamic forms and dynamic space, and, but not just on, on the floor plan. Uh, here, it's the, the, the hexagon obviously creates this dynamic floor plan, but he also does it three-dimensionally, so that when you move through one of Frank Lloyd Wright's houses, uh, it does not have a uniform ceiling, the way in many buildings it's just one ceiling height that goes throughout all the rooms. Here, it's the ceiling is constantly changing and the spaces are, are, are modulated and uh, transformed in this amazing kind of way so that when you, for example, come, when you come in the front door into the entryway, it has a distinctive kind of space which is very high and narrow. Uh, 
and they, the, the space moves up. And in fact, their skylights are what are called clear story windows up at the, uh, right under the, the roof where the light comes in, comes in from the above and it gives it a, a special kind of light quality in this very high and narrow space. And then you immediately, when you start uh, to come into the living room, you have to go under a very low ceiling. It's so low, in fact, that, that, uh, that when I bring uh, groups of students here, sometimes uh, a student will have to actually duck a little bit to go under this, this, this low uh, ceiling. And people often ask, well, why did Frank Lloyd Wright do that? And um, there are uh, stories about this. So there are legends that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, for example, who was, uh, was relatively short himself. He was a short man. Some people have said that he um, was trying to get back at tall people or that it was some kind of, uh, you know, he had some kind of funny hang up about this. And so he wanted to make people uh, uh, duck if they were tall. But that's not the real reason. The real reason is that he was constantly experimenting with, 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 with spaces and creating dynamic spaces. So he wanted you, he wanted to make some ceilings low so that you would have to, so that you would actually physically feel that this ceiling is kind of pressing down on you, that you'd even maybe feel a little oppressed by it, so that when you then move beyond it and move into, into this space where the ceiling rises and you have these wonderful um, uh, sloping surface surfaces and the, and the walls open out so that, uh, that you see out into, into nature, that, it's, that you have a kind of liberated sense after having experienced uh, this, this tightness of one space, you move into an, a, a, an expansive space, and then you, you move around into a different kind of space. And you move from spaces that are, that are very bright because the, the uh, light streams in through large windows, and then you move into darker spaces. And this is all part of the plan. This is, this is part of, of his idea of, of creating uh, uh, architecture that's a constant kind of adventure where you're experiencing, almost in this kind of visceral, bodily kind of way, uh, not something in, that you think of intellectually so much, but that you actually experience in a very physical kind of way. And as a result, it's hard to photograph Frank Lloyd Wright houses, even, even with video, I think. It's hard to get a, a real sense of what it's like to be in, in his buildings, uh, because it's, a, it's this physical sensation that of walking through, through these spaces and, and feeling in this kind of bodily way what uh, what all these, uh, uh, these innovations do. And, um, so the, and that's one of the really wonderful things about this, this house, the different levels and, the, and these unusual spaces you, you go through. That's great. That's a good thing to get. Yeah. They are, but they're very tough to film. Yeah. yeah I know, and it, I, I don't know just how you can do it, but, but, but try maybe like when you, uh, if you, when you're filming, come, come through the front door and then maybe you shoot up so that you see that it's a very high space and then turn and, and, and show somebody walking, walking under this, this little bit of ceiling here, which is, especially you should do that because you're tall enough that it'll, that it'll really see, you, people will see how, how unusual this is, that it, it's this very, very low ceiling. Okay. And then that you come in here and that, and that it changes again and that you look out through these windows and then that you move around the fireplace. The fireplace here that is typical of a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright's fireplaces in that it, um, it acts as a kind of pivot for the, for the house, that everything almost revolves around it like a the hub of a wheel. And, and so you, you feel like you're, you're almost kind of drawn around the, uh, around the hearth and this, and this fireplace and uh, move into, into these darker rooms. And then, and then you, it's not only the ceiling which is changing, but it's the, but it's the floor that's changing. Because you're, you, you go down some steps and then up some steps. And this is partly as a result of a response to the, to the um, topography of the hillside, of course. But, but it's also, Wright wanted to take advantage of this so that you would move up and down. And, and that helps uh, intensify this sense of, of these um, spaces that are so dynamic. Mm -hmm. and even the stories of him going and changing the furniture, it seems, I'm just curious if, if, if he was really sacrificing the function for, for the form. And, you know, I, you know, I'm sure his ego is well documented, but yeah. is that kind of what happened here? And is it a trend that, mm -hmm. that 
Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, like all modern architects, he was certainly interested in, in function, and there's this idea that form follows, follows function. And he cer certainly, in, 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 in most ways, he was interested in solving functional problems. And he did it very well, and that's why people constantly came to him and wanted him to design houses for them, because they worked for the most part. But there is this other side of Frank Lloyd Wright, which was that he was constantly experimenting. And he didn't just want to find one good solution for something and then just keep on doing it. So he was constantly trying new things and, and pushing things to their limits and beyond their limits. And as a result, sometimes he did things which were, he went too far sometimes. And so he did sometimes do things that were, that were impractical in one way or another. And it was just, it was sort of an occupational hazard in a sense, or, or a, um, uh, a byproduct of the fact that he was, was never satisfied with just, with the status quo, or doing the, the same thing over and over again. So the fact is that there are sometimes problems with his houses. And, um, and people often talk about, about these problems. It's often said that Frank Lloyd Wright's roofs leak. And they certainly don't all leak. But uh, they do sometimes because he created these very unusual types of roofs to create these, uh, uh, these spaces. And he tried new materials and putting together things in, in, in different ways and joining things at, at funny angles. And, and so inevitably, as the res uh, there was a price to pay sometimes, not always, but sometimes for his inno innovations. And, um, but, uh, but by, by only focusing on these problems, it, uh, one misses the, the, the main point, which is that, that he was opening up new horizons for American architecture and creating and, and, and exploring new ideas, which then other people developed, often in more practical ways, like the Eichler houses that, uh, uh, and, and American suburban houses in general that come out of Frank Lloyd Wright's work. Uh, and so he had, in, in the final analysis, he had very functional and practical influences on American architecture, even though individual houses of his often had certain practical problems because he was the one who was exploring things for the first time. Yep. Great.